Peace be upon you YouTube, this is Saeed Mirza and uh, today's video is going to be about Salat. Now Salat is kind of a trigger word for Muslims. Uh, whenever they heard, hear the word Salat, they automatically think uh, ritual prayer. And uh, this ritual prayer uh, is pretty much the most prominent thing in the religion of Islam. And um, by the ritual prayer, by what they mean is that uh, it is a, a movement, it's a ritualistic movement that's performed uh, while facing the direction of a stone idol in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, the Kaaba. Now, coming from a Muslim background myself, it was drilled into my head that uh, as long as I performed the Salat, which uh, in Urdu is called Namaz, um, then I was pretty much guaranteed uh, entrance into paradise because that's the one thing that God is going to question us about. But uh, I wanted to look uh, in the Quran and uh, show you that the Salat in the Quran is uh, is a much more broader concept it's uh there's many different types of salat in the quran and uh to claim that salat is just a ritual prayer in the sense that's performed by muslims is not really understanding what the quran means by the word salat and i'm not arguing here that worship of god is not salat obviously worship of god is a salat it is one of the types of salat in the quran and um remembrance of God, worship of God, glorifying Him, praising Him. These are all Salats, but there are more Salats in the Quran. And uh, Muslims, unfortunately, have restricted themselves to just uh, uh, bowing, prostrating, and uh, you know, doing this mechanized ritual without quite understanding what they're doing or really understanding what the point of that is. I mean, anecdotally, um, when I was... When I was a teenager, uh, you know, and I, my mom would say, okay, you have to go praise the Salat, you know, time is up. And in Urdu, it's called Namaz. Then uh, I would just, I'd usually be watching TV or something like that. And I would wait for the commercial break and I would perform the wudu, the ablation and run and do the Salat and then uh, try to get uh, done um, before the commercials ended. And uh, unfortunately, this is really the uh, reality of what how the Salat is treated by Muslims. And again, I lived among Muslims. Uh, I live among Muslims. I, um, you know, my parents were Muslims. I, I, for the longest time, followed the religion of Islam. So I am familiar with the mindset um, of how this idea of Salat is, sits in the minds of Muslims. Now. I am not debating here whether prostration or bowing or standing up are comprised the salat, uh, the the one type of salat in the Quran. I am only saying that uh, the mechanized uh, ritualistic uh, format of the salat as practiced by the Muslims is not found in the Quran. And uh, facing the direction of a stone idol in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, is not sanctioned in the Quran. And uh, Muslims, even though they make a big show of uh, doing the Salat, for the most part, are not really grasping the idea behind this Salat, which is the remembrance of God. And um, if you point out to the Muslims that this beloved ritual is not found in the Quran, then they will automatically argue that it's found in the Hadith. But actually, the this ritual, this this the implementation details of this ritual from beginning to end are not found in a single Hadith. That's also a verifiable fact. And then uh, if you show them that, then they'll claim that uh, this was preserved in the community practice, uh, which they call the... Uh, the Sunnah of the Prophet the, that has been passed down generation after generation and that the Ummah has somehow preserved that and so it's impossible to fool that many people. Um, but if you take that line of argument then um, what's happening in Makkah, Saudi Arabia uh, during the Hajj pilgrimage, uh, if you ever looked at it closely what's happening is is pure idol worship. They're kissing a black stone, they're circling it and uh, you know throwing stones at uh, stone pillars. This is all um, pagan uh, practices. So if this was preserved by the Muslims or was invented and then later on uh, kind of enshrined in this uh, idea of the Ummah preserving it, then obviously the idea that uh, this Salat was somehow um, you know, practiced by Abraham and passed down um, without any sort of uh, uh, 
modifications uh, is kind of a stretch. And even within Muslims, the salat, the, the way they perform the salat varies. So to make that argument that this is somehow preserved uh, by the community is uh, not borne out by uh, the facts in front of us. Now, again, I wanted to bring your attention to the salat in the Quran, which... Uh, you know, obviously worship of God is a Salat, but it is only one type of Salat in the Quran. There are many other types of Salats in the Quran. And uh, it doesn't really make a difference how you worship God. Uh, you know, whether you stand, you bow, you prostrate. What matters is your uh, inner um, intention. You are, are you actually uh, remembering God or not? This is really the core of the matter. Because unfortunately, what the religion of Islam now is, is just... Uh, um, it's just a husk. It has. It's. It's performing the outward rituals without really understanding the reasons for doing that. And we're gonna touch on that, God willing, uh, pretty soon. But before I continue, I wanted to let you know that a lot of this material is from the excellent work by Brother Garrett's titled "The Quran: A Complete Revelation," which you can download for free from Quranite.com, or you can access his entire material for free in a, a um, in a very user friendly format. Uh, on reader.coronite.com so now I'm just going to read to you a little bit from the article. Now the idea behind this video is that there is a much more detailed article that I posted on the website that I do hope that you will read through. Uh, but in here, in this uh, video, I'm just going to kind of hit the major points and uh, you know, try to show you that the, the, the Salat, that the types of Salat in the Quran uh, are varied and they depend upon the context and we can figure out what the 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 duty is the implementation of the commandments of the uh, of god in the quran by looking at the context where this word is used which we will we shall do god willing so first of all god commanded moses to uphold the salat in his first meeting with him and uh, obviously prophet M moses uh, musa did not have any idea what salat was this was his first encounter with god okay so we read in chapter 20 verse 14 i am god there is no god save i so serve thou me and uphold thou the duty for my remembrance okay so this is uphold thou the um Let's uh, least okay. So obviously the idea is to hold uphold the duty, uphold the salat for what? For remembrance of God. Then we have in chapter 20, verse 42, Go thou and thy brother with my proofs and flag not in my remembrance. So this was the idea behind the salat. But again, this is one type of salat in the Quran. Not all salat is remembrance of God. So there are other places in the Quran where this encounter with God is uh, detailed and uh, you can check those out for yourself. It's chapter 27 verse 9 and chapter 28 verse 30 and in all of these verses there is no indication of uh, God telling Moses about a ritualistic prayer, a specific format that he must implement to uh, uphold the Salat. Whatever it was, Moses knew what it meant. So it's just a general meaning saying, uphold the duty for my remembrance. Now, I've gone through the Quran and I have looked at all the instances of this word Salat and looked at the context to determine uh, what the specific Salats are. And I've, uh, uh, I've categorized them by type. Uh, I, I encourage you to look at the article because there I'm not all the verses I'm not sh reading to you all the verses that uh, you know uh, comprise each category so I'll just go over a couple of verses but again the idea is that you can infer what the Salat is by looking at the context okay the first one is serve God alone say thou as for me my Lord has guided me to a straight path a right doctrine the creed of Abraham, inclining to truth, and he was not of the idolaters. Say thou, my duty, and my penance, and my living, and my dying, are for God, the Lord of all creation. He has no partner, and that I have been commanded, and I am the first of those submitting. Say thou, is it other than God I should desire as Lord, when he is Lord of all things? And every soul earns not save for itself, and no bearer bears the burden of another. Then to your Lord is your return, and he will inform you of that wherein you differed. 
And he it is that made you the successor of the earth and raised some of you above others in degree, that he might try you by what he has given you. Thy Lord is swift in retribution, and he is forgiving and merciful. That's chapter 6, verses 161 to 165. So here, um, say thou my duty, which Brother Gans is translating Salat as duty. Uh, it says here that my duty and my penance and my living and my dying are for God, as in I am serving God alone. Uh, that's my point of existence. Um, and here we have an, another interesting piece of it. And he it is that made you successors of the earth and raised some of you above others in degree, okay? That he might try you by what he has given you. So God has raised some people above others so that they may use them uh, to get work done, right? And so those people are, um, in effect, serving the people above them. And by this example, God is teaching us that we should be serving God alone, Again, there are other verses that you can take a look at. I'm just, I just pulled out one verse, but there are other verses that will kind of make clear to you that the context is of serving God alone. Okay, next one is remember and actually here's another one that um, touches upon service to God alone. He said, I am the servant of God. He has given me the writ and made me a prophet and made me blessed wherever I be, and enjoined upon me the duty and the purity as long as I live, and dutiful to my mother, and he has not made me arrogant or wretched, and peace be upon me the day I was born, and the day I die, and the day I am raised up alive. Chapter 19, verses 30 to 33. Obviously, this is, uh, the in context, this is referring to uh, uh, Jesus uh, when, uh, you know, he was in the cradle and he spoke to the people. Again, he said, I am the servant of God. And and enjoying upon me the duty and the purity as long as I live, the duty to serve God alone and dutiful to my mother again to um, obviously we're supposed to obey our parents um, for the most part. And uh, unless they, you know, uh, command us to ascribe a partnership to God. So here again, you see the same theme developing, serving God. OK, next one is remember and glorify God. So remember me, I will remember you, and be grateful to me, and deny me not. O you who heed warning, seek help in patience and duty, God is with the patient. Chapter 2, verses 152 and 153. Again, see, it's the same idea, that we are to seek help in patience and duty, and uh, right before that it says, remember me. So how should we be seeking help from God? By being patient and remembering God. Okay, here's another one. O you who heed warning, when you rise up for the duty, wash your faces and your hands to the elbows, and wipe your heads and your feet to the ankles. And if you are unclean, purify yourselves. And if you were ill, or on a journey, or one of you come from the privy, or you have lain with women, then find not water, resort to clean soil, and wipe your faces and your hands with it. God wishes not to place any distress upon you, but he wishes to purify you and to complete his favor upon you, that you might be grateful. And remember the favor of God upon you and his agreement which he agreed with you, when you said, We hear and we obey, and be in prudent fear of God. God knows what is in the breast. This is chapter 5, verses 6 through 7. So, What's being talked about here, that you rise up for the duty, the Salat, which in this instance obviously means to um, purify ourselves by performing ablation and to stand up and uh, remember God. So yes, this is closer to the idea of a ritual uh, worship, and I agree, but uh, it doesn't tell you any format, and it doesn't tell you to face a stone idol in Makkah, and it doesn't tell you to you know uh, adhere to a specific um, format. Again, it's just a general idea that you should remember God and you should remember the favors that God bestowed upon us and the agreement which he agreed with us. So, you know, this is a lot of people have trouble with this because they say, look, it's talking about, uh, you know, abulation and it's talking about standing up for God. I agree. And it's talk in this, this type of Salat, remembering glorifying God is uh, a timed ritual. Uh, but again, the idea behind this is that it's, it's a timed uh, activity and uh, to make it into a sort of a very format, uh, specific, uh, rigid and, uh, you know, um, um, a mechan me mechanistic idea uh, which is devoid of any sort of inner um, intention 
and uh, it, you're not really getting um, the meat of it. You're just kind of sucking at the bones, if you will. Okay, here's another one. Chapter 11, verses 114, 216. And uphold thou the duty at the two ends of the day, and at an approach of the night. Good deeds take away evil deeds. That is a reminder for those who remember. And be thou patient, for God causes not to be lost the reward of the doers of good. O oh, that among the generations before you there had but been a remnant forbidding corruption in the land, save a few whom we saved among them. But those who did wrong followed what they had been given therein of opulence and were lawbreakers. So this is pretty self-explanatory. We're supposed to be upholding the the duty to, to for the remembrance of God, for glorification of God at the two ends of the day and at the approach of the night. Okay, here's the last one. So remind thou if the reminder should benefit. He will take heed who fears, but the most wretched will avoid it, who will burn in the great fire. Then will he neither die therein nor live. He is successful who has purified himself and remembers the name of his Lord and performs the duty. This is chapter 87, verses 14 uh, to 15. Okay. Now, the number three type of Salat is God's duties. This is God's Salat. Again, see, if you have this idea in mind that Salat is a ritual prayer and you try to enforce it across the Quran, you're going to have trouble because it's saying here that God also performs the Salat, which obviously does not make any sense. And what the translators do at this point, the traditional translators, and Brother Garrence has covered this ad nauseum, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, what they do at this point is that they obviously change the meaning of the word salat and they use something like, you know, sense blessings or helps or, you know, something like that. Uh, and they don't want to use the word prayer uh, or ritual prayer because obviously it doesn't make any sense. So here you go. This is chapter 2 verses 156 and 157. Who, when calamity befalls them, say, we belong to God and to him are we returning? Upon those are duties and mercy from their Lord, and it is they who are the guided. So the believers, when a calamity, when they are faced with some sort of misfortune, they say, we belong to God and to Him are we returning. Upon those are duties and mercy from their Lord, and it is they who are the guided. Now, what is God's duty here? It is to uh, lead men from the darkness into the light. And uh, if you take a look at my uh, broader work, uh, William R. Reason, uh, God's Arguments in the Quran, um, I've touched upon this and uh, uh, shown that uh, God's duty is his salat towards the believers is to bring them uh, from the darkness into the light, as in bring them from you know uh, being astray in the way towards his guidance. Now, interestingly, um, Again, coming from a Muslim background, you know, you see Muslims doing mindless stuff. They don't really realize why they're doing it. They've just kind of absorbed this stuff, but they don't know why it happens. So again, the Islamic religion now is just um, superstition. Um, is it has nothing to they don't really understand what the point is of things and uh, in that regard when someone dies muslims usually uh, say inna lillahi wa inna lillahi rajiun uh, from god we come and from and to god we are returning so they don't really understand that context here is talking about that the believers are supposed to be saying this when misfortune uh, afflicts them anyway Next one is believe in the doctrine. Now the doctrine ad deen in the Quran is uh, the whole um, subset uh, to you know believe in God and the last day and his messengers and his book and his messengers uh, and uh, you know um, basically believe in the unseen. So this is chapter 2 verses 1 through 5. Alif Lam Mim. That is the writ about which there is no doubt. A guidance to those of prudent fear. Those who believe in the unseen and uphold the duty. And of what we have provided them they spend. And those who believe in what was sent down to thee. And what was sent down before thee. And of the hereafter they are certain. Those are upon guidance from their Lord. And it is they who are the successful. So here the performance. The upholding of the duty. Is to uphold this doctrine. To hold fast to it. 
Okay, here's another one, chapter 6, verse 92. And this is a writ we have sent down, one blessed, confirming what was before it, and that thou warn the mother of cities and those around her, and those who believe in the hereafter believe in it, and they preserve their duty. So they're preserving their duty. They're, they're holding fast again to this belief, to this doctrine. Okay, next one is chapter 30, verses 30 through 32. So set thou f thy face towards the doctrine, inclining to truth, the nature of God with which he created people. There is no changing the creation of God. That is the right doctrine, but most men know not. Turning in repentance to him, and be in prudent fear of him, and uphold the duty, and be not of the idolaters, of those who divide their doctrine, and become sex, each party exulting at what it has. Now, what's interesting is that the Quran calls the idolaters those who have divided God's doctrine into sex. So there you have it, okay? So those people who have divided God's doctrine into religions, whether it's Christianity or Muslim or Islam or Judaism, they are the idolaters. This is the reading, this is the plain reading of the Quran. And because they divided the doctrine, we are to uphold the duty and not divide the doctrine between amongst ourselves and not create sex, but be unified, be believers, a community of believers. Okay, the next type of Salat in the Qur'an is calling to God. He makes the night enter into the day, and makes the day enter into the night, and He made subject the sun and the moon, each running for a stated term. That is God, your Lord. To Him belongs the dominion, and those to whom you call besides Him possess not the skin of a date stone. If you call to them, they will not hear your call, and were they to hear, they would not respond to you, and on the day of resurrection, they will deny your ascription of partnership and none can inform thee like one aware. O mankind, you are in need of God, and God, he is the free from need, the praiseworthy. If he wills, he will remove you and bring a new creation, and that is not for God difficult. And no bearer bears the burden of another, and if one heavy laden should call to his burden, nothing of it will be carried, though he be a relative. Thou but warnest those who fear their Lord unseen and uphold the duty. And he who purifies himself, he but he who purifies himself for his soul, and to God at the journey's end. This is chapter 35, verses 13 to 18. Okay, so though the, you is telling Muhammad, God is telling Muhammad, you only warn those who fear their Lord unseen and uphold the duty. And uphold the duty, the whole thing is talking about calling to God alone and not calling anyone besides God because they have no power to cause us harm or benefit. Okay, next one is chapter 3, verses 38 through 39. Thereupon Zechariah called to his Lord, saying, My Lord, give thou me from thyself goodly progeny, thou art the hearer of supplication. And the angels called to him as he stood performing the duty in the chamber. God gives thee glad tidings of John, confirming a word from God, both honorable and chaste, and a prophet among the righteous. So, you know, the context here is that he goes to visit Mary, Mariam, and he sees that she's a very devout person, and... Uh, at that point, he prays to God that, uh, you know, give me uh, from thyself a goodly progeny and that you are the hero of supplication. So he calls to God. And right at that moment, the angels call to him and they said, when he is performing the duty in the chamber. So this is not that, you know, he went somewhere and started doing the salat, the ritual prayer, facing the you know, a, a specific direction that this happened. This was right there and then. So he was performing the Salat as he was calling to God. And then right there and then, the God responded to, to him and gave him the glad tidings of John. Okay, next one. Chapter 10, verses 87 through 89. And we instructed Moses and his brother, Settle your people in Egypt in houses, and make your houses a destination, and uphold the duty, and bear thou glad tidings to the believers. And Moses said, Our Lord, thou hast given Pharaoh and his eminent ones adornment and wealth in the life of this world. Our Lord, that they might lead astray from thy path. Our Lord, destroy thou their wealth, and harden thou their hearts, so that they believe not until they see the painful punishment. He said, Your supplication has been answered, so take a straight path and follow not the path of those who know not. So God commanded Moses to uphold the duty, uphold the Salat. And, uh, and how did he uphold the Salat? He called to God and God responded to him. 
Okay, last one. Chapter 17, verses 1, 10, and 1, 11. Say thou, call to God or call to the Almighty by whichever you call. To him belong the most beautiful names. And be thou not loud in thy duty, nor quiet therein, but follow thou a path in between. And say thou, praise belongs to God who has not taken a son and who has no partner in dominion nor ally from weakness and magnify thou him with glorification. Okay, so the next salat, type of salat in the Quran is the recitation of the writ, the, the, the Al-Kitab. This is chapter 17, verses 78 to 81. Uphold thou the duty at the merging of the sun until the dark of night and the recitation of dawn. The recitation of dawn is witnessed. And some of the night keep thou vigil with it, as an addition for thee. It may be that thy Lord will raise thee to a praise station. And say thou, My Lord, cause thou me to enter at a true entrance, and to leave at a true exit, and appoint thou for me from thyself a helping authority. And say thou, Truth has come, and vanity has passed away. Vanity is to pass away. So, the Quran, God is giving us the prayer, the, 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 the things we have to say in our Salat. Um, okay, here's another one, chapter 21, 29, verse 45. Recite thou what has been revealed to thee of the writ, and uphold thou the duty. The duty forbids sexual immorality and perversity, and the remembrance of God is greater, and God knows what you do. So the recitation of the writ puts, uh, puts us in uh, prudent fear of God, and increases us in taqwa, and... Uh, by that, you know, by, by the warnings we read in the Quran and then the sort of the imagery we get for about hellfire, we are less inclined to uh, commit sexual immorality and perversity. And the duty forbids, as in the reading of the Quran, the Quran, you know, when we read the Quran, God is forbidding us to, uh, from sexual immorality and perversity. This is the next one, chapter 35, verses 29 to 31. Those who recite the writ of God and uphold the duty and spend of what we have provided them secretly and openly expect a trade that perishes not, that he will pay their rewards in full and increase them out of his bounty. He is forgiving and appreciative, and that which we reveal to thee of the writ, it is the truth, confirming what was before it. God is of his servants, aware and seeing. Again, self explanatory that we are to recite the writ of God and uphold the duty. Okay, the next type of Salat is fighting in the cause of God. Had they gone forth with you, they would have increased you only in ruin and been active in your midst, seeking means of denial for you. And among you are eager listeners to them, and God knows the wrongdoers. They sought the means of denial before and overturned matters for thee until the, the, the truth came and the command of God was made manifest when they were averse. And among them is he who says, Grant thou me leave and subject thou me not to means of denial, save into the means of denial they have fallen, and Gehenna encompasses the false claimers of guidance. If good befalls thee, it vexes them, but if calamity befalls thee, they say, We took our command before, and they turn away exulting. Say thou, nothing befalls us save what God has prescribed for us. He is our protector, and in God let the believers place their trust. Say thou, do you await for us save one of the two best things? And we await for you that God will afflict you with a punishment from him or at our hands. So wait, we are with you waiting. Say thou, spend willingly or unwillingly, it will not be accepted from you. You are perfidious people. And they prevents their expenditures being accepted from them only that they denied God and his messenger and come not to the duty save as idlers and spend not save unwillingly. That's chapter 9 verses 47 to 54. Again, see the idea that the Salat is a ritual prayer in this context doesn't make any sense because it's talking about fighting in the cause of God and that these people, they didn't want to fight in the cause of God. They were making up excuses and... Uh, you know, even when they came to the duty, when they came, you know, in the muster, when, fight, when fighting the cause of God, they kind of stayed on the sidelines. And that's referred to in another place in chapter 9, Surah Tawbah. So, you know, this is, I mean, if you're reading the Quran and you're seeing this, it's pretty uh, difficult to grasp the idea that all of a sudden it jumps into a ritual prayer when the whole idea, when the chapter 9, uh, the whole of chapter 9 is actually talking about fighting in the cause of God. Okay, next one. Take witnesses when death approaches. O you who heed warning, a witness between, between you 
when death approaches one of you at the time of bequest is two just men among you or two others from other than yourselves if you are traveling in the earth when the calamity of death befalls you detain them after the duty and they shall swear by god if you doubt we would not sell it for a price though he were a relative nor will we conceal the witness of god then would we be among the sinners chapter 5 verse 106 again the idea that uh, you are to detain them after the duty so so for instance if you're if you you know you're about to die and you know isha already passed you know the last prayer the evening prayer are you going to wait till the morning prayer and do the prayer and then detain them so this whole idea would not make any sense but if we understand that salat just means duty then yeah that the duty is to um have witnesses present so you know you can um have them write down your will or attest to it so that's the duty of the believer when he is about to die so detain them after the duty after they have confirmed that they won't uh you know they they bear witness to what you're saying and the wills have been written down or you know dictated to them then you they shall swear by god that we will not sell it for a price okay next one submit to god has thou seen him who forbids a servant when he performs the duty has thou considered if he is upon guidance or enjoins prudent fear? Has thou considered if he denies and turns away? Knows he not that God sees? No, indeed, if he sees not, we will drag him by the forelock, the lying, offending forelock. Then let him call his counsel. No, we will call, call the guards of hell. No, indeed, obey thou not him, but submit thou and draw thou near. That's chapter 96, verses 9 through 19. So this person is is forbidding the servant from performing the duty, which is to submit to God. Um, again, I encourage you to look at these verses carefully and also read the article in which other verses are presented. Okay, next one, observe your pacts. This is the next type of Salat in the Quran. And remember thou in the writ Ishmael, he was true to the promise and he was a messenger and a prophet. He enjoined upon his people the duty and the purity and was pleasing in the sight of his Lord. That's chapter 19 verses 54 and 55. Now obviously the messenger had duties as well and that's referred to in the Quran as well. So the messenger had duties. And perform thou not the duty for any among them that dies ever, nor stand thou over his grave. They denied God and his messenger and died while they were perfidious. That's chapter 9, verse 84. And among the desert Arabs is he who takes what he spends as a loss and awaits reversals for you. For them is the evil reversal, and God is hearing and knowing. And among the desert Arabs is he, is he who believes in God and the last day and takes what he spends as a means of nearness to God and the duties of the messenger. In truth, it is a means of nearness for, the, for them. God will make them enter into his mercy. God is forgiving and merciful. That's chapter 9, verses 98 and 99. Okay, another type of duty in the Quran, obeying God and the messenger. It's true. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the problem is that the messenger is not with us anymore. He's dead. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's other places in the Quran where um, the commands were only... Um, binding upon the believers because the messenger was pre present for instance it says that you should not enter the house of the prophet uh until you be given leave and then when you are given leave then enter and then after you read and disperse obviously you can't do that anymore and uh, you know it also says that you should lower your voice in front of the messenger again this is something you cannot be done so here in that scenario obeying god and messenger when he was alive made sense now if you the claim is that you're obeying god and the messenger by following the sunnah or the hadith uh this is a false claim because these hadiths were written down centuries after prophet muhammad's death by questionable characters and obviously you know this has already been talked about by me and brother garens for um for for years now and uh you know uh, to stake your soul upon some person um you know who had a vendetta against the uh um the against islam uh you know Bukhari was a Persian and all the Persians were basically overrun by the Arabs um and again because the Quran says to be that it is clear complete and fully detailed so uh, if the Quran's claim is that it is fully detailed sufficient for guidance then we should hold on to the Quran alone um 
please refer to my book in which I've discussed these uh, issues at length. Anyway, obey God and the messenger. They ask thee about the spoils of war. Say thou, the spoils of war are for God and the messenger. So be in prudent fear of God and make right in what is between you. And obey God and his messenger if you be believers. The believers are but those who, when God is remembered, their hearts are afraid, and when his proofs are recited to them, it increases them in faith, and in their Lord they place their trust. Those who uphold the duty and of what we have provided them, they spend. It is they who are the believers in truth. They have degrees with their Lord and forgiveness and a noble provision. Okay, next one. God and his angels perform the duty for the prophet. O you who heed warning, perform the duty for him and greet with a salutation. Those who hinder God and his messenger, God has cursed them in the world and the hereafter and has prepared for them a humiliating punishment. And those who hinder believing men and believing women with what they have not earned, they bear, they bear a calumny and obvious sin. Chapter 33, verses 56 and 56 to 58. Now, interestingly, Muslims, whenever you say Prophet Muhammad, they say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is, again, they're parroting stuff that they, um, they've they heard from their forefathers. They don't really know why they're doing it. And so if you ask the ulema, they'll say, this is what it's saying, that, you know, God and his angels perform the Salat for the Prophet, and oh, you were heat warming, perform the Salat for him, and, uh, you know, Salamu Taslim and greet him with a salutation. Uh, again, the idea is that you should have the right conduct with the messenger, with the prophet of God, you know, and you should honor him. And uh, God and his angels perform the duty for the prophet, again, by helping him, by bringing him from, uh, by, by guiding him. God guided Prophet Muhammad. He wasn't always guided. We read that in the Quran. So this is what the word Salat means in this context. It doesn't mean, uh, you know, a ritual prayer or, you know, sending um, salam invoking you know um, salam for Prophet Muhammad who obviously can't hear us okay next one be grateful and we give Luqman wisdom be thou grateful to God and whoso is grateful he is but grateful for his soul and whoso denies God is free from need and praiseworthy and when Luqman said to his son while he exhorted him O my son ascribe thou not a partnership to God ascribing partnership is a tremendous injustice and we enjoin upon man concerning his parents his mother bore him in weakness upon weakness and his weaning is in two years be thou grateful to me and to thy parents unto me is the journey's end but if they strive with thee to make thee ascribe a partnership to that of which thou hast no knowledge then obey thou them not and accompany thou them in the world according to what is fitting but follow thou the path of him who turns to me then to me is your return and I will tell you what you did O my son, though it be the weight of a grain of mustard seed, and it be in a rock, or in a, the heavens, or in the earth, God will bring it forth. God is subtle and aware. O my son, uphold thou the duty, and enjoin thou what is fitting, and forbid thou perversity, and be thou patient over what befalls thee, that is among the resolution of affairs. And turn thou not thy cheek to men, and walk thou not in the earth haughtily. God loves not every conceited boaster. And be thou modest in thy walk, and lower thou thy voice. The most loathsome of voices is the voice of the donkey. This is chapter 31, verses 12 to 19. So God, so Luqman was uh, exhorting his son to be grateful to God, and to be grateful to his parents, and uh, to be humble. So this is my understanding that here in this context to uphold the duty is to be grateful to God. Okay, the next one is to be modest. And are those who confirm the day of judgment and are those who of the punishment of their Lord are in dread. The punishment of their Lord is not that from which there is safety. And are those who preserve their chastity, safe with their wives or what their right hands possessed. For then are they not blameworthy, but whoso seeks beyond that, it is they who are the transgressors. And are those who are to their trusts and their covenants attentive, and are those who in their witnesses are upright, and are those who preserve their duty, those are in gar gardens honored. Chapter 70, verses 26 to 35. The next one is feed the needy. No, indeed, it is a blazing fire, removing the scalp, calling him who turned and went away and gathered and hoarded man was created anxious when evil touches him impatient 
and when good touches him withholding save the performers of duty those who are constant in their duty and those in whose wealth is a due known for the petitioner and the one deprived chapter 70 verses 15 through 25 so feeding the needy this is one of the types of salat in the quran and as you progress to the latter part of the quran you will notice that this theme of feeding the needy of uh, encouraging others to feed the needy comes up quite regularly actually in one of the uh, uh, verses it says that uh, uh, you know he says that when that has come to him he says my lord send me back so that i might um spend or, or and and work righteousness and uh, feed the needy you know this idea of of feeding people um of helping the poor is is very uh in in, in the, uh, the latter part of the quran is uh is is repeated again and again okay final one devote yourself to god we have given thee abundance so perform thou the duty to thy lord and attain thou mastery he that hates thee he is the one cut off chapter 108 verses 1 2 3 now i understand this to mean that god had given uh muhammad uh, abundance as in he didn't have to worry about you know day-to-day -day work you know labors i mean a lot of men they're diverted from the remembrance of god because they don't have the time because they're busy you know trying to make a living so in that regard you know if you have the resources the financial resources then you need to commit yourself to spending as much time as you can devoting yourself to god and performing the duty again so these are the types of salat in the quran um obviously by just focusing on uh you know this ritual prayer muslims are depriving themselves of the other types of salat in the quran which a believer is to uphold so again to recap of course salat means worship of god remembrance of god glorification of god and uh, the problem is that the muslims have turned this into a highly specialized mechanized ritual um, which is devoid of any sort of substance and uh, its emphasis is on you know facing this stone idol which uh, this 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 ritual is not found in the quran and it's not found in the hadith and uh regardless uh, the idea behind it what the salat is uh, that type of salat is is set up for the remembrance of god so as long as you are remembering god that's the point of the salat it's not this outward show this ritual that muslims you know go to the masjid and you know they put on perfume and you know they do this whole activity and you know after that it's social hour Again, I'm coming from this background. I've seen all this. I've, I've lived it. I've breathed it. So I know what I'm talking about. So, uh, you know, I'm not condemning anyone. I'm just saying that uh, if you are uh, focusing on the outward acts, um, then you are missing the real point of Salat, which is remembrance of God and uh, devoting yourself to God. So again, for me personally, I do the Salat, this type of Salat, worship of God. Um, I do the ablation and I stand up and I recite verses from the Quran. And, uh, you know, remember God, glorify God. Sometimes I bow, sometimes I prostrate. Um, and then I read the Quran. So, and depending on, you know, how long I, it depends, you know, it, you don't, I mean, for me personally, I don't want to force myself. And when I when I'm really into it, then I I stay and I do it for a long time. But that's just me. I'm not saying this is the only way. You know, I'm just giving you a practical example of how I implement the salat uh, according to the Quran. And this is only one type of salat. There's many different types of salat in the Quran as we went through it. So it again is let, uh, left up to the individual on how he chooses to worship God and how he wants to implement the other salats in the Quran. Obviously, feeding the needy is just one aspect of it. Um, whether you directly feed them or you give them money or you know how much you give, it's up to you. You know, God, the Quran is giving us so much leeway. God is giving us so much leeway. God wants us to develop as responsible human beings uh, who take responsibility, who act on their own initiative. And uh, this is really the point, which if you follow the religion of Islam or any other religion, that just squeezes everything out of you, all the individuality, all the independence, and everything has to be done in a certain manner. 
By making a me mecha mechanical ritual prayer the focus of the religion, Muslims have sadly ignored the other many salats or duties which the believers are required to uphold in order to please God. So this is sort of the ending of my presentation on Salat. Um, again, I do encourage you to read the article on the website. That the article goes into much more depth. Uh, it examines the idea of Salat using the Quran in much more detail. There are many other verses in the Quran, and uh, you know that article is part of the chapter. is is one of the chapters of my book. Well, you know, reason which is now published and is available for free download on the website and God willing it should be available on Amazon as well I'm not trying to sell you my book I'm just saying that you know um, this is all out there you know Brother Garen's work is out there his 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 complete work is for free um, I encourage you to quite to look at these 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 topics carefully and uh, you know don't just uh, take my word for it um, examine examine the Quran and examine the arguments and then come to a conclusion uh, unfortunately our forefathers didn't really look into the Quran I mean speaking for myself my forefathers didn't really examine these questions they didn't never had they neither had the time nor the inclination and uh, they did not have the background that we do and we have the the internet which allows us to you know look into these questions very carefully and um learn so again i do encourage you to uh, read up on what i'm saying and um, god willing until next video peace and blessings be upon you